But anyways, howdy y'all, I'm Joe Hughes. We are here for better code and collaboration through open source concepts, dev containers, and code spaces, just because I really couldn't figure out what else to write for the title of this thing, so there it is. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, disclaimer, I work for the big bright orange one up there, if you couldn't guess. Um, but legitimately, I use you know half of these products still in my uh, lab environments or have used them in customer environments in the past. Uh, absolutely love hanging out with the Patch My PC and Chocolatey guys as well because they're just awesome. Uh, and especially Andrew Pla from PDQ and the PowerShell podcast. So the one thing I ask for audience participation is please go tell the vendors that you had fun this week. You know, thank them for the swag and all the other things. And then also go thank the event staff, especially after everybody thinks that we are upset about the uh, the party last night. I ended up being able to go get some dumplings over at Din Tai Fung. So I wasn't sad that I was able to squeeze that in, unsurprisingly, so. Who am I and what do I do? Uh, like I said, I'm Joe Hughes. I'm a consulting field solutions architect at Pure Storage. Uh, I am back to being a pre-sales sales weasel. But I'm a community guy at heart, right? That's what I claim most of the time. The, the real job is kind of the side job to me. Uh, I'm a co-leader for the Denver and VMware PowerShell, uh, sorry, the Denver PowerShell and VMware user groups. <clears throat> I am a serial collector of communities. I did lose a bet to somebody last year, so for the next four and a half months, I think, uh, he forced me that every time I do a slide about myself, I actually have to put my accolades and all of my little stamps on the thing, and it makes me feel like a tool. But um, I legitimately like being part of the community and being a leader or trying to help people uh, and just being active. I am only where I am in my career and being able to present with any of these events that I go to because I had other people that helped me out along the way. So I try and do the same for others. Oops. I think we're gonna test the durability of the stage today. Uh, and as of uh, 22, I became an international speaker. Uh, I actually got to speak in uh, Canada, Australia, and Portugal all in one year, so that was fun. Um, I'm easy to spot in a crowd. Previously at Veeam, I was in the green hat. Now I'm at Pure, I'm in the orange hat. Uh, occasionally I represent stuff for my local dad's group that I'll cover in a little bit, so it's just a bright blue hat, so just look for the big grin and the loud howdy y'all. I have little shame, really none. Hence the, you know, fantastic, uh, what were the glamour shots that, that uh, we decided to do at the Willis Tower that year. But really, I just try and share my learnings with others. There's no reason that everybody shouldn't be contributing back. Uh, I, I love the fact that this conference actually has the lightning demos. Those are a fantastic opportunity for everybody to contribute back uh, for something that is a very, very low barrier to entry. Number one, you've got you know five-ish minutes, and if you're running over, they will basically just like walk you off the stage, or they'll cut your video feed and just move over to the other presenter. But also, understand this, and especially with all of your local user groups and all of your communities, everyone in the room wants you to succeed. Like, they wanna see what you have to share, they want you to do well, they want you to be happy with your presentation and, and what is the result of you sharing these things with everybody and they want to get the investment back on their time that they're giving you for this. So like everybody wants you to succeed with these things. So there's no, there's no reason not to try. I always challenge people to push themselves, learn more and don't fear that sharing, right? Doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter like how simple you think it is, somebody else is not gonna know it or somebody else is not going to understand it the way that you do. I tell people to share your knowledge, right? Your perspective is important. The way that you explain a thing, the way that you got to the result, the way that you figured it out or troubleshot something or went through certain steps to build a workflow or something might be entirely different from the way that I do it or the way that I explain it. I can say something to somebody a thousand times and they don't get it at all. Somebody else chimes in and they're like, oh, it's like this. And everybody in the room is like, oh, now I got it. So. Always share, right? Again, your perspective and you being able to explain things from your point of view and how you got to these results is something unique. So please share that with the community. And then teach whatever you can. I forget where this originally came from, but Don cleaned this up and put it into the uh, Be The Master program and, and into the books uh, before that thing turned into like, I think it was like Drive Your Tech Career. Uh, I forget what the new version of the book was. but. It does not matter if you are teaching somebody something that is not technology. A lot of times that is entirely more useful. Number one, Don would always fall back to um, mechanical inclination for things, right? He was a geek uh, with Jeeps. So he would fall back to telling people things in a mechanical sense, right? Some people are visual learners, some people are auditory learners. So whatever it is, right? If you can explain things in different ways, then you might get your message across, but also, 
if you can teach somebody something like changing a tire, like that is a universal life skill that you can teach to everybody. It has nothing to do with tech. So it's probably more applicable than a lot of the things that we actually do day to day that have a much smaller audience that we can share those things with. So teach whatever it is that you can. And then job versus career, especially with the number of communities that I'm active in, I get frustrated a lot at how many people have never thought about this or just don't grasp the concept. Your job belongs to you, sorry, your job belongs to your employer, your career belongs to you. I say this thing so often, it frustrates me when I fumble it. Your job might change tomorrow, right? That might be your decision, that might be your boss's decision, that might be a reorg, that might be a bus that takes you out at the corner, whatever it is, right? That's potentially out of your control. Your career is within your control. You can drive yourself, you can study, you can switch fields, you can look at a new employer, you can pick up new skills. Sometimes you can just realize that the pay is the same, right? If you like it or you don't like it, the pay is the same. If work sucks, find something else outside of work, find a better hobby, find something else to invest your time in, collect a paycheck and go focus on the next thing or the thing that actually drives you. Now to the part where I always feel like a tool. So. Like I said, I'm active in the community. I'm a VMUG leader. I'm a new MVP. I'm a VMware V expert. I'm a Veeam Vanguard. I'm a Tanzu Vanguard. I'm a Cisco champion, and I still help host V Brown Bag on Wednesdays occasionally. <sighs> Again, I just like the community. Uh, I like giving back to the folks that gave me an opportunity and helped me out along the way, so I try and do the same and pass it to others. But all of that stuff aside, what I like most about presenting is showing people that I can get up here and I can screw it up and it's really not that bad. So audience participation, nobody dies. I go for the chuckle or the groan because then I know everybody's at least somewhat, you know, awake and alive, hopefully still at this point. But yeah, seriously, don't let any of this scare you, right? None of this is that bad. Even I will screw this up and we will all survive. Again, audience participation, nobody dies. Phil, looking at you. But really, the thing that I love the most, uh, last year I had the opportunity to step up to the executive board for Dads of Castle Rock Community Outreach. This is the nonprofit that's run by my local dads group. We're a town of 80,000-ish people. Uh, we have 1,600 to 1,700 dads that are, that are in the group, really a couple hundred of us, you know, two, 300 that are, that are super active and stuff. <clears throat> We've been incorporated for five years this November. We've brought in and paid out a million dollars in charitable contributions, right? Had some massive impact for some really good and some really bad crisis events in our, in our town. Um, but I was able to step up and join our grants committee um, for applying for funds. Uh, and most recently, I got the opportunity to actually step up and be the program sponsor for our mental health program. The only way that I'm able to do all of this is through the life experience that I've had, and especially in the past couple of years, all the presentation and community experience that I've had of connecting with different people all over the place and being able to leverage those connections to help people back home or to reach out and get help for myself to improve so that I can help other people. So again, find the things that drive you and like go focus on that. All right, we're gonna jump into Git basics for a little bit. Uh, who's actively using Git a lot? Cool, don't judge me because there's a lot of this I still suck at. <clears throat> but I really wanna focus on Git ignore files for avoiding mistakes and conflicts, right? How do you CYA before you screw up in the first place? Um, meaningfully putting in good commit messages and pull requests. Uh, and that's, to me, still a, a recently new thing for actually having to work with people that are significantly better developers than I am. Um, and some of it's kind of frustrating. So yeah, some of this was even just my thoughts where I actually had to take time and, and put together some of this stuff. So Git ignore files. I like sharing this with folks because a lot of times it's more important the things that you absolutely make sure you do not put into source control and you prevent mistakes that will either cost you money as soon as somebody finds your access keys and starts burning all your uh, dollars in the cloud or just making sure that you don't share something into your Git repository that makes it to where basically it's easier for you to just burn it down and start over. So <clears throat> what kinds of things make sense to have in your git ignore files, right? Log files, do you actually need to check those things into source control, whether that's your internal git repos or uploading things to GitHub? Sometimes this makes sense if you're logging 
particular errors or things with an install, then maybe that makes sense to be up there. Sometimes it makes sense to just exclude all of those entirely. Compiled code, right? Especially large binary blobs or executables and things like that. You really don't want that in your source control or in your repositories themselves. System files, um, particularly things like if you're, if you're running any stuff with like Ruby or um, if you're running NPM or a bunch of JavaScript stuff where it will come up with all sorts of these extra files that it just dumps in place, a lot of that you don't want to deal with, right? Sometimes, and, and I hammer on this a couple of times throughout this presentation, uh, just dealing with Python stuff, right? I'm not a huge fan of Python, probably because I'm terrible at it, but dealing with all the stuff that it shoves everywhere and like every random version of things is difficult to deal with, so I try and exclude that stuff from GitIgnore. Obviously, usernames, passwords, environment variables. Oh my, right? Um, the good thing about using these gitignore files in specific ways is that you can absolutely exclude file names, certain file extensions, right? And if you have a standardized way of actually using these things inside of your environment, if you use environment variables, if you use standardized, um, say, credential files or logging files or other inputs in your environment for your code, by using a git ignore file, somebody will know the file name <clears throat> of like what is your environment uh, variables file, but they won't know what those actual like secrets are, right? Because you can just prevent that from ever getting checked into your source control. Typically, it's a lot easier to just make sure that you never do it and make an exception if you find out there's a problem later on. How do we absolute? How do we actually control the git ignore? Right? You can do it at a global level, so you can put it in your git config that anything that Git looks at, it will automatically ignore all of these files that match these certain patterns or anything. <clears throat> you can put it um, in your personal profile. So if you use multiple Git profiles, you can have it just by profile. So if you're working on work things on a work email address versus things that are on a personal email address uh, in those Git profiles, then you can ignore different things in either one. <clears throat> or you can, uh, you can control all of this with a Git ignore file in the repository itself. Right, so if you want to just exclude things, potentially even just based on the type of code that you're running, if you run all of your Git repositories from a template because of what, what code you know and what programming language you know you're gonna have inside of there, then you may have those templates set with a Git ignore for all of that specific type of file structure that you're gonna have there. And then how do we actually run these Git ignore files? <clears throat> all of this is a pattern by line, right? You can use extra blanks for readability. There's, there's no weird, funky white space stuff you really have to worry about there. Uh, an asterisk is a wild card. A slash is actually for a directory, right? The pound sign is, or sorry, the, uh, the, the bang is for uh, negate what comes next, right? So not entirely different from, from PowerShell. Uh, and then you can use a question mark for a one character wild card for these things. So at this point, I will flip over and we can actually take a look. <clears throat> um, global takes preference over everything because it's at your as your at your Git um, config, basically your install of Git on the on the box. Uh, then it will look at your personal preferences. Then it will look at a Git ignore file. Uh, in the repository itself. The, git, the, the closest you get is the git ignore file there, and it basically, um, if there's a conflict, that, I believe that's the one that takes precedence. Double check, because I might be totally wrong. 50-50, right? Yes. Yeah, but if there's a conflict, I don't know, try it out. Do it on a private repository. Okay, let's get. Does the dark mode bother anybody? Can y'all see? Is this more bothersome? It's fine. We'll go with light mode. Otherwise, I get groused at. Okay, that makes it a little bit easier. Where did we shut this thing? PSH Summit 2024. Trying to be better at all of this, but yeah, this is just. 
kind of terrible. You know what? Here, let's do this first. We'll look at some samples uh, of better than what I'm going to do interactively first, and then we'll look at doing this live. So for some Git ignore samples, um, there is an awesome repository that's up on GitHub for um, all sorts of Git ignores based on what it is that you're working with, right? So uh, let's see, for say Visual Studio Code, right? By default, if you do not want to check in your settings, your tasks, your launch, your extensions, right? If you don't wanna be overriding something that somebody else is doing, uh, in a single repository that somebody's basically just cloning your code, this will prevent all of those files from uploading. They also won't see your config and all the other god awful stuff that you have in there. Um, I know it was just at Summit last year, I think, that I first saw that Justin Grody had like flipped back and forth between like three or four different profiles in his session. And I was like, oh my God, I don't have to have like all 68 of my extensions installed all at once and VS Code doesn't need to run just dog slow. But your profiles, your extensions, and all of that stuff, if you don't want that to try and override what somebody else has as their personal preference, then you wanna exclude these things from going into your code repository. If you're doing things like we're gonna do later on with having like dev containers where you want to have all of this set because it's a shared project and you want everybody to comply with the standards and you wanna make the installs easy for all of this stuff, then you want these things checked in, right? So again, it kinda of depends on what it is that you're doing for the code and for the repository itself. Another great one for like Windows Git ignores is just making sure that anything that's your recycle bin, right, your, your stupid little thumbs database files, uh, don't get shoved in there or installer files or things like this, right? Very simple to have wildcard.file extension and basically nothing of that will ever get uploaded into your repository itself. But let's go take a look at what we have explicitly in here. Let's get into Okay. So, inside of here, I want everybody to just take a look at what we have in here, right? So, a couple of directories, a couple of files and some specific um files that are in here with extensions that we may or may not want to actually have inside of your environment. Give me one second to get to my notes so I can somewhat pull this off. But uh, these are all just blank files, right? I just put everything in here to, to have some demo stuff to go take a look at. But what Git is seeing is everything that we have inside of this directory. The first thing I'm gonna do is put in a new item of dot get ignore. Here, you know what, sorry. Let's initialize this. So in get status, it knows about my get ignore file, it knows about my inputs, it knows about my logs directories, but otherwise it's not tracking anything else. But as soon as we start adding things to this get ignore file itself, they will start disappearing out of what it is that Git is aware of and looks at as tracked or untracked on disk. So if I say that I want to like ignore that entire inputs directory, inputs slash, save this thing, all those files in that directory went untracked, right? So. If I have other inputs that are in there that I want, then I don't want to do that, right? Maybe I want to do environment vars dot env and ignore that single file itself, dot enter, right? And we'll see that the inputs folder itself is now untracked, but this individual file, whoops, there we go that one file will drop from being untracked to grayed out, right? Git is, Git is unaware of this thing. So if I come look at my Git status, let's do CD into my inputs. It's aware of that top level Git ignore file, it's aware of the logs, but like nothing else is inside of there that it's, that it's looking at. 
There are times that you will want to do exclusions by like an entire directory. Sometimes you'll want to do them by file type. Like I don't want any zip files inside of here. So let me save this and this logs.zip file should save. Should go untracked. Fun, fun. It's not seeing it there. Oh, there we go, okay, just running slow, sorry. So yeah, if I want to ignore everything that is a zip file to not be uploaded into my code repository, right, then I can do that by file extension. Or if you want to call out individual files by direct file path, or if you want to negate individual files and make sure that those are always in there, then you can do that. If you've already locked something out of Git, then you're gonna have to go and do a force add to put it back into your repository, but there are ways to get around this, right? What's up? Uh, you can, but then you're, you're basically going back and changing Git history. Um, I probably should have prepped that to put it in my demo. I have to do that once in a while and I legitimately have to go look at my notes every time because I forget how to do it interactively. But yeah, you, you have to go back, you have to like reset the head to where you were right before it. Um, most of the time that I'm doing this, especially if it's my first check-in or if I'm making bulk changes or I'm like building out a, a structure that's not from a template, I will go try and build even the blank files of what I know I'm going to use first and then try and do my git status to go look at everything. And most of the time I have a pretty decent structure for everything and I've got a couple of like scaffolding files that will put all the blanks in place so that I can make sure that I have my, my git ignores set properly. Um, but I also just keep a handful of git ignore files that'll drop into repos <clears throat> based on what project it's gonna be. But yes, if you have committed something, you can roll back to the merge, ignore it, and then and then do another commit. If it's too much stuff, especially if it's only your single repository that you're the only using it, I'm not always you know afraid to tell people to just burn it down and start over. So depends on how much actual history you have inside of there, right? Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, let's let's give it a shot. So for zip, let's do negate logs dot zip. And let's see. Yep. So that one because it's it matches like full file name is now back in here as an untracked. Um, there is basically a gigantic man page for all the um, rule sets that you can have for gitignore and like all the weird hashing and all the regex style stuff you can do for it. Some of it gets very, 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 I'll say obtuse to find out and figure out. Um, so for a lot of people, I recommend if most of your code doesn't change that much or if what you're doing, sorry, I need to make this a little bit bigger. Um, if most of the things that you're working on are pretty standardized most of the time, like figure out your <laughs> patterns that you wanna have and like put that at your personal git profile level or keep those git ignore files and just be ready to drop them into your repositories because then you're at least doing minor tweaks from what's like your 80% correct most of the time sort of thing. Um, so you don't, you don't spend a whole bunch of time trying to figure this stuff out on the fly. All right, so that is basics of git ignore files. We will jump back into the deck. So outside of doing any massive team co-development stuff, who uses Git branches? Hey, surprising number, awesome. Y'all are significantly better than me then. Um, I legitimately got into this and started using branches to try and number one, get people to actually go commit code because trying to take new people and have them understand how to work around like merge conflict issues just got people to give up, right? So I started having people, number one, start just committing documentation into code because then, especially when something breaks, you can say, okay, are the docs up to date? Yes, and if so, cool, when was the last time they changed and that's the thing to go look for so you're not scrambling at three in the morning to try and you know determine who made a change and caused an outage and doesn't want to own up to it. Um, 
but then with doing something easy like just documentation, getting everybody to put everything in one place, not only do I typically ask people to start out with their own individual folders by their name, so they're like they're committing to a, like their own kind of dedicated space, but then also using a branch that has either their name or like the name of whatever task it is that they're working on. So when they do check in that code before it all gets merged together, like maybe the end of the week or something, then nobody's having weird conflicts throughout. You might do one round of merge conflicts, but typically if everybody's using their own branches and putting things in their own folders, that should be very rare that somebody's trying to overwrite somebody else's script or file or any of this stuff. But when I started doing more demonstrations around the basics of Git for folks, I started thinking like, ooh, hey, these are really still just point in time commits that you have and by having these branches, you can like roll forward and roll back and make it easy for people to see in a GUI view of like, here's my code at this point in time. So I started naming my branches as like step one, step two, step three, right? So they can see, and a lot of it was more for infrastructure as code. So as I'm building new things or as I was writing a bunch of Terraform and like, Step one is go provision this thing. Step two is once that's there, go provision this. And I could easily walk people through showing them how everything expands and builds on top of each other because they can just look and see what new files exist for this thing. So I tried to use this more as a teaching tool and just getting people to kind of understand how the process flow works, especially if they are not super proficient at Git because I can explain to them like, here's getting a list of the branches and then here's moving from one to the next. So when focusing on branches, right, try and still focus on a single task. Whether you're doing code for shared documentation, whether you're doing code for a shared project, whether you're actually doing true software development stuff, you still want your branches focused on a single thing, like a certain feature, um, a certain issue you're trying to work through, you wanna be able to track that stuff and understand that that's what ideally all of that linear code is, is trying to do. Again, it also helps helps avoid conflicts, right? Because if you're committing to an individual branch that's focused on that single task, you probably don't have a lot of code conflicts with everybody else on things. It really does help keep your code streamlined on what it is that you're actually working on and keeping it going in one direction. And like I said, I like using this a lot as a training and onboarding tool because the branches have the capability of having a distinct name for that single point in time of your code. And again, doesn't need to be used only for code or software features. So let's jump out. Come on, there we go. All right, so let me get to a clean spot. Better code, okay. This is where I'm going to hope that from having done this so many times, uh, my PS read line complete will save me from terrible typing and finding this thing. Yep, there we go, cool. So this is some code that I used for building out a demo of Terraform on VMware Cloud and AWS. Platform doesn't matter at all. It's the fact that you have to go provision the infrastructure environment, right? The dedicated hosts gets built out as step one. Step two, you actually have to go put the firewall rules in place because it's completely locked down by default. Step three is going and creating a VM that lives inside of that environment, right? So very clean. This process has to be done before this process can be done before this process can be done. And at first, even though I was using this thing as a training tool, I was terrible at following my own advice or thinking my way through this thing. So I created this with branches that had very nondescript names. Like they had a very descript name for the thing that it does, but not in what order it needs to happen. So yeah, if I look at these, oops. What I originally had was just add NSXT rules, create SDDC, create VM, right? And then I was like, crap, I can't remember which one of these comes first. So then I took those same branches, right? Those same point in time commits that I had, rolled back to that commit and said, just restamp this as a branch that is step one versus step two versus step three. 
The cool thing about this, let's pull up VS Code to look at it live. So let's move this over here. So at this point, I'm on main, I'm at my latest commit. If I go back, and as you can see, like everything here, like I've even just got the files themselves named as like one, two, three, right? So within the code itself, it's kind of easy to follow along and see what it does, but when you're looking at it from the Git repo side, wasn't the clearest thing in the world. But if I go back to, if I check out step one, within this GitHub uh, repo itself, right, and, and VS Code being aware of what's going on inside of Git and updating this thing quickly, when I check out that branch of that step one, everything that did not exist at that point in time goes away, right? And even my versions Terraform file or whatever my readme file was goes back to what the commit was at that point in time. If I then do a checkout to step two, those files will reappear on disk and all these other files will go to whatever I might have added into that readme file at that time, right? So if you're writing your code and you're having separate documentation that lives in it, but all of that stuff is getting checked in and your commits are, I'll say, complete for what it is that you're wanting to do, even when you go do a uh, merged squash and only keep certain commits in your history, you can still have some of those and pull them out to be a branch just so somebody can very easily identify what this thing and roll forward and roll back in time to see like the entire state of your code, right? This is all just how Git works. I just thought this was an interesting way of making it easier for people that are new to it to have an easy way to kind of roll back and forth and not just have to go learn digging through Git log files and then switching to particular commits themselves, right? The branch is a little bit easier to tell it like I'm checking a thing out and some people understand that a little bit better than telling it like, you know, I need to go to this commit with this head identifier and things like that. So that was just the way that worked in my head. Hopefully anybody else thinks that's useful. All right. Yeah, git commits. Um, I, I throw this one in here because I still have problems with this, right? And, and especially when I'm working on something and I'm doing a terrible job uh, like even when I was doing a GitHub Actions demo for OnRamp yesterday, I was like, ooh, I'm up at three in the morning, I get a little bit more time to put together a demo. I was like, I used somebody's sample repo where they had a couple of mistakes in here, and I'm like, I'm gonna show these folks how to do a little bit more on the commits and, and get bit, a bit more of a workflow run history by fixing some of these things throughout. I used my friend's code last year, and I fixed it in, I don't know, six, seven commits or something like that. Yesterday, I was at 43 commits and I was like, damn it, I don't know what's wrong here. But I still showed it to them anyway. I was like, hey, guess what? Here's DevOps. Like, I was feeling fast. But my commit message just turned into, ah, er, er, error one, error two, trying it again. What the, you know? So remember, commit messages are what other people are going to see. They may not necessarily look at the timestamps to realize that, yeah, that commit that you had that was kind of gnarly was like you being frustrated at three in the morning, right? Commit messages are something that people will judge you from a little bit, right? Because they don't know you and they're just seeing your message and you need to think about that a little bit because like these will live in history. Be thoughtful of what you are doing in these commit messages, right? Are you talking about things at the high level? What overall does this do, do as a strategic point in time for your code repository versus is it a tactical thing where like, I did this one very minor incremental change, but I need to save it because I know I'm at a good point that I want to be able to revert back right here, right? Or think about it as the what, what is this repository doing? Where have I decided I'm making a change in this project and what it is we're trying to do here, right? Maybe I've decided we're gonna go tackle some new problem or I wanna go add a GUI to this thing or something like that, right? Or it's the why, why am I making this change? What did I finally figure out that was broken or what did somebody put in a request for an additional feature or fixing a bug or something like that? <clears throat> Smaller and single purpose, right? This is commits overall. Check in less code more often. That's just better, right? 
Um, I honestly say this to remind myself as well, like I shouldn't have code commits that are 400 lines of code if I stopped 10 points throughout there and it was like 50 lines of code at a time, right? Every one of those legitimately should have been com a, a commit. I've started pushing myself to even just <clears throat> commit small point in time things, even when I'm in the middle of a line of code and I know I'm gonna context switch and like my brain's gonna forget what I was doing 10 minutes from now, like I will commit that just so in case I close that project and don't get back to it for 30 minutes or like three days, then I know exactly where I was and I can at least try and figure out what it was that I was doing, right? I don't wanna just like leave stuff hanging out there and not be doing the commit messages because I'm just trying to force myself to be more mindful at what it is that I'm doing, right? Commit more often. Chances are every one of us is doing more stuff than we necessarily should in the, um, in the span of our, of our git commits, right? We're just, we're going too long in between. And again, for me, it's as much, if I'm gonna get on a call, uh, if I'm gonna get up and go like walk my dog, sometimes it's even if I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee, because of the fact that me being like, ah, I'm gonna go get a cup of, you know, be back at my desk at five minutes. And then my wife is like, you've been talking at me for an hour and 10 minutes, please go back in your hole, right? Hi, hon. Um, Yeah. Normally, so for those ones, for the for the for the for the the single top line message that that will pop up in like the one liner for the Git log history, I I always leave every one of those as point in time check in or like in progress check in, and then I will skip down like. So another thing I'll get into with the with the commit messages, right? Uh, and I think I think a couple lines later I have this. We'll just cover it now. Um, when you do your top level Git commit message, normally you're just Git commit dash uh, m and then like in a, in a single or double quote, that first line is gonna be what exists inside of your Git log that everybody will see even when they run like the one line or the, or the pretty log. Keep that less than 50 characters, right? That's just kind of like the agreed upon standard, right? Um, then skip one line below that and then put in a longer message if you want for other things, right? And that can be multiple lines afterwards. I wanna say the, the normal rule that I see that everybody argues about is like 70 or 72 or 75 characters or whatever for like the, the longer bulk of the history. I also try and do better on those ones to actually do just a git commit and like open that in a code editor and force myself to just take like 10 seconds to type out, here's what I'm in the middle of thinking, here's what I was doing, here's the thing that just broke that I'm trying to figure out or whatever and like I just try and brain dump what I'm trying to like take out of the memory of my brain, put in there so that if I read it later on, I've got a 35% chance that I can actually like pick it back up from that point and not just, you know, undo whatever I just did. That to me is just more of a like figure out what works for you in the process, but don't, th this is me trying to even just be better at, at following more of the, um, what was that David Allen thing? The getting things done, right? My brain has terrible background processes that will just like hang and spin. Like if I do nothing other than write something down, I can legitimately be like cool and like calm myself down. Some of that's me and my anxiety or my fear that my wife or kids are gonna be upset with me that I forgot something, right? And, and for me, a lot of times it's the act of writing it down whether it's handwriting or like just doing a commit message or something like that, I'm like, I feel better because there's a good chance that I can remember what that is. Maybe not, but that lets me like walk away and feel more confident that I can context switch and that I'm not so worried about not committing the thing because of the fact that I won't remember exactly what I was doing right then. And like, I'd rather have like, if my machine blows up or something like that, the fact that I've done a git commit and I've pushed it to even my local server repo, not up to GitHub or whatever, like I'm, I'm trying to just be better at like, I'm okay with where this thing is in progress. It doesn't have to be perfect. And this is just for me and it's making sure that I don't lose something. So I think of it as much as a backup as anything else. That's me, that's my process. So yeah. Um, yeah, so back to that first line message versus the blob of text afterwards, right? Concise description and then more detailed explanation. Think of this, um, 
I think the best quote I heard about like fundamentally how to think about and use Git, especially for yourself, was Scott Hanselman. And I think it was like during when we were all in COVID. Uh, I think it was when he was doing a, a series that was like computer stuff they didn't teach you or something. It, it, in one of his videos, he made this comment of using Git or using source control is working with your past self and your future self. So be nice to that person. And I was like, ooh, like that really meant something to me. Um, Cause yeah, I've beat myself up too many times where number one, I was either not using source control and had V1, V2, V13 working, you know, scratch. Oh my God, I'm starting over for like the names of all of my script files. Um, but yeah, then it was like, when I was thinking more of my process of working on it and all of these commit messages and all the things that I was doing in source control being more for me than for other people, cause I don't normally work on a ton of collaborative stuff. Um, it changed a lot of the way that I, that I worked with it and I became more okay with just like, eh, this is where I'm at, it works, it doesn't work, here's what I'm working on right now and like, I need to be able to just put it aside and, and like hold it right there. <clears throat> Character limits. Most people are not um, really strict about this. There will be some code repositories that you look at where they actually have like full on linting rules and like, their, um, their automation around their code branches will say like, well, you have too many characters, we don't like this, and give you like little, little weird warnings and stuff. Uh, look for contribution rules on open source repositories that you're gonna commit things to and just you know basically play along nicely with their community rules. Otherwise, do what works for you. Um, and sometimes, like I said, it's worth using the text editor. Like it's, for me, it's just better to freeform text if, and, and type something in VS Code than it is to do it at the command line. My brain just doesn't work that well when I'm thinking I'm writing something that's gonna perform an action and potentially like take down a service or something rather than just like, ooh, I'm just in Notepad, right? That's just me. And then searchability, right? Back to that high level versus low level or being strategic versus tactical. Think about what you yourself or what someone else might try and look for in that short, concise description that you have. Because that's gonna be what most people see inside of the logs. They're not gonna look at absolutely everything that you have inside of your commit messages. So, that's my rant about that. Pull requests. If anybody has better opinions on this than me or just wants to tell me I'm wrong, please feel free, because I'm still trying to figure out the whole pull request thing. Like. Uh, in the past couple of years, honestly, like working with this community in particular on the PowerShell Conference Book 3, I think was the first one I came in on, and then uh, actually the modern uh, IT automation book, like that's, that's probably where I stole like half of all the stuff I figured out for dev containers was the first time I ever saw it was doing editing for that book and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like I just open up VS Code or like jump in a container and it has like the veil rules all set up, like I don't have to figure out how to install all these extensions. It was phenomenal. I only ever learned about dev containers because I volunteered to like edit a book. But I'm still absolutely terrible about pull requests, right? But this is more so even just me saying things out loud that I need to remind myself that you really should do. Similar to your commits, right? Write the pull requests smaller. It's better for you to be having one pull request that has a bunch of tiny little changes that you can track or to squish those together, but have smaller pushes on things you're trying to improve. And especially if you're contributing to a shared repository for a lot of folks, or a tool, or a script, or something that somebody has a lot of investment in, even if you are trying to make an improvement, number one, talk to them first. Don't have like your first interaction with them being like, hey, I'm fixing your stuff and adding all these features and blah, and it's like 500 lines of code, right? maybe come up with a plan of like, hey, I'd like to do this, and here's the couple of steps I think it should be, like make it a collaborative thing. Talk to people, not just send, you know, commit requests and, and or uh, commit messages and pull requests back and forth. Link these things as much as you can to an actual issue inside of Git, right, uh, or GitHub, or link it to an issue that you are having with the code or with your internal environment or link it to a ticket. If you work on any, any type of ticketing based system, whether this is just bug tracking for things that you're doing and it's in a different platform than GitHub, or if you have things that get tied to actual IT operations tickets inside of your environment, 
tie the code and tie these pull requests to fixing these things as much as possible, right? That will help drive you towards that branch methodology of single task. It will help you to have clear commit messages of this is the thing I'm trying to fix. And then when you have those pull requests tied to it, it's much easier for people to go review that and say, ooh, I know exactly what it is you're trying to do here. And yes, let's look good, or no, we need to like go fix this a little bit. Review the pull request yourself, but as not you, right? Imagine that somebody else is just getting what's essentially like an email or a ticket for, hey, here's a bunch of code I wanna go push. And without you having your thought process behind it, number one, would you be offended by it? Number two, do you think it's actually doing something clearly to either fix a problem or make an improvement? And number three, did you make it clear in the text of your pull request of what it was you were actually intending to do with it, right? Don't assume that people are just going to read your code and like be able to read your mind. Sometimes just use your words, put it in a pull request. Linters and automatic tools. This goes back to honestly all things DevOps. Let the machines do the things that they're way better at than we are. Um, the way I tried to just explain this to the, the on-ramp folks yesterday that kind of hit me after a conversation earlier this week was make yourself into that, you know, quote, 10X engineer, like put all the tools in place that make it seem like you have a whole team of people that are either doing things all simultaneously in parallel or that you have a whole team of people that have your back that are double checking to make sure you're not making simple, easy mistakes because you can have those tools do a lot of that stuff, right? For me, um, Linting, number one on YAML, because I'm terrible with white space, and nobody ever wants to admit that they spent eight hours trying to troubleshoot a problem that was a white space somewhere at the end of a line. Uh, it sucks, you don't ever want to do that again. Um, so like, use the tools inside of VS Code to look for things like you know extra white space. Use automatic formatters, or before you commit your code in your pull requests, make sure that you have run things through a lint, right? Standardize the formats, uh, even when I'm doing a bunch of stuff inside of Terraform, right, I run a Terraform format that really does nothing other than basically like align all the tabs, align all the um, equal signs and things like that. Because then from one commit to the next, it's easier for me to go look through the code and see here's the lines that actually changed, not just here's the ones that think they changed because the space moved from one side of a equal sign to the other. Let the machines do the thing that they do best, and you can put a lot of these rules inside of GitHub or GitLab or Gitty or almost any other flavor of, of source control that you want, where they will even run through all of this linting to tell you that these things are okay, or they're just kind of like auto reformat your files before those pull requests go through. Huh? Uh, normally I want to test before committing. So like I'll typically have Git action, uh, GitHub actions doing stuff uh, either just against the code itself if all I'm doing is, is cleaning up scripting and things like that, that I'll run pester tests to just make sure that like all the bits that I expect to be there are, are correct in the code and have it run through the uh, script analyzer to just make sure that things are right there. Um, or if it's actually going to be deploying stuff inside of my environment, I will have GitHub Actions runners that run on push, and like before it allows me to actually merge that code in, it tells me like it works or it doesn't work, or like if this thing blew up or just your script won't load on a Linux box, but it's perfectly fine inside of Windows PowerShell, then it like. Right, yep. But yeah, for me normally, in my mind at least, pull request is when I'm finally like, okay, it works for me. I'm gonna see if it works for you too, right? Um, again, for those of y'all that do this more often than me or that have differing opinions, please you know, feel free to throw them out. Um, oh yeah, sorry, on that last point. Uh, defining a workflow and owners, right? Especially if you're doing joint things with other people, just kind of have an agreement of who's doing what and what's your process, what works best for you and other people. Um, determine who is responsible for certain things, especially being able to work on that group project with, what was it? 20 of us or something that were on that book, um, that was phenomenal. Like having different people that were editors for specific chapters or people that could approve certain parts of the books or even having different people that approved like the bios for all the authors, even if it was just a bunch of markdown file. Like 
that was a very, very cool for, thing for me to just be like, ooh, I feel like a grown-up developer, right? Um, look at a bunch of those projects that are, that are jointly um, put together, right? And just see how they do their Git operations, especially within GitHub. You can easily go look at the tracking and the logs and see where tags get put in place, where they have workflows that go to certain people. You can just look at their, their commit requests or their, uh, or their pull requests and like the histories and all that stuff and see where things get paused or that the system automatically says like, okay, this is stopped here until such and such approval is in place by a certain person. Um, if you're on the other side of this, right, like not only should you be leaving comments for the reviewers of your pull requests, but if you are somebody that is looking at a pull request because you're the owner of a repository, do your best to try and respond quickly, even if it's just, hey, I got your pull request, not necessarily sure what this is, or like, it looks good, but I'm working on something else and I'll merge it later. Like, try not to let, I mean, vacations aside or real life or other things, try not to let somebody put in a pull request on, on a thing that you own and like have it just sit there for a month before you're like, oh, yeah, cool, looks good. You know, um, that will discourage people from contributing to your projects. And then those same git commit rules still apply. Like your commit history ought to be pretty clean, ought to look like something somebody can easily read and follow along with. It shouldn't be some crazy, ah, okay, I finally made this thing work. Here's my pull request, right? So sometimes you can even just go back and clean up the, the git commit messages. So. I, I will say my thoughts on it is it depends and normally I will do different things for different projects. And what I mean by that is if all the commits are small but they're all going in a certain direction and like there's three or four key points where I ended up having like 14 git commits, I will go back through and I will cherry pick to say like, okay, here's where it finally got to this completion point of like I, I met this simple task that I was trying to do, it just took me a couple steps in between or I had some small checkpoints. And I will, I will have a pull request that will have like those three or four cherry picked commits that were like at a solid point where it's like, okay, I'm part of the way here where I've addressed this thing where I, I you know, did certain points of what I would say were completion where like those three commits together make sense, but by themselves, they don't necessarily need to be like the history that somebody can go through and look at. That's just me. Again, a lot of this stuff is just collaborative and, and you talk to the folks that run the projects with you. Yep. Not. I wouldn't even necessarily do a different branch. I would just even go back through and do like a merge squash, right? And just just oh. pick those certain commits. Um. Yeah, I see Anthony. He's like if he's nodding, I'm like doing pretty good. Thanks. No, I just, like, you do phenomenally more code than, than most of us, so I'm like, if you're not, you know, frustrated and throwing things at me, then I feel like I'm telling people kind of decent stuff, so. Um, so. Sure, say it again so I can. <laughs> I was following along and then my brain was like, mm -hmm. so. Okay. Got it, okay, yes. So if you have things like GitHub Actions that are running workflows based on like what your commits are and things like that, then you may wanna align your commit history for the pull requests to be like where certain things happened or potentially like if you had a bunch of specific failures and then finally had like one successful one, maybe that's the one you keep and not the others. So yeah, cool. Watch Michael's session for stuff. It was awesome. So, yes. um, all right. So before we jump into like the actual code for the the dev containers and code spaces, and at this point, if we have time for it, the uh, the polyglot notebooks, uh, real functionality of just essentially VM versus container. Um, this is the same slide I show to folks when I'm trying to get uh, vSphere admins to kind of understand containerization, right? Back in the old days, we had 
infrastructure, right? Network, uh, storage, all the other things until we get to a hypervisor level. Individual VM is that red box that's right there. Has a full guest OS, has all of our binaries and libraries, forces you to live in DLL hell, and then has an application sitting on top of it. And every time we need a new application, if, especially if they conflict or somebody says they need different resources or whatever, right, they get their own VM. So you're now managing guest operating systems, all this stuff. As we moved over to containers, right, we now have like the entirety of our infrastructure and then OS and then a container runtime engine, right? Most places this was Docker. This is a lot of people is starting to flip over to uh, Podman now or I forget what the new uh, CRD is. Um, but basically, the container should have all the stuff that you need for the application, right? Whatever the underlying bits are, whatever the, in our instance, as we're talking, talking about uh, dev containers, like whatever extensions you need, whatever things you want for somebody to be able to pick up your code and immediately be effective with it is in that container, but nothing else. The other thing I like about dev containers is it forces me to make sure that I'm actually really good with my code and I'm not depending on environment variables or global variables or other stuff that I have that's in my personal profile to be there to make stuff run. So a lot of times I will even just test my code in dev containers to figure out what bad assumptions did I make thinking that I was being clean about my code and it wasn't actually there. So the whole, the whole concept of the container is basically just that for whatever it is you're trying to do, in this instance, instead of an application, it's our like code repository. Everything that it needs ought to be in that container. The awesome thing about doing this with the dev containers is that you can actually just make this thing available, whether somebody's running on Docker on their machine or they're running in a code space, where they can just go into your repository, jump into that container, and they have all the bits that are there, right? You're not overriding any of their settings, you're not messing with their workspace stuff. Someone can go and contribute to a clean version of your code in a clean environment where you know you're both like jointly working on this thing there and you don't have to worry about anything else that they have. You can also have a clean environment for your code where when I jump back and forth between Ansible or Terraform or PowerShell stuff, I may have a bunch of just gobbledygook that's all over the place. And even just having those extra extensions or um, formatters that are trying to fight each other for telling me that my code looks weird on the screen or something, I don't have to deal with any of that stuff inside of the dev containers. At this point, pray to the demo gods because the strongest steel is forged by the hottest dumpster fires. So, as you can tell, I have all the confidence in the world of uh, my laptop not smoking itself right now. But dev containers specifically, for the most part, uh, especially if you are not building from a Docker file, if you don't have some super custom thing that you need, if you can just get away with whatever flavor of Ubuntu you want and then put some VS Code extensions on top of it, all of this is going to be managed in a folder of .dev container and a single file of dev container.json. Then again, if you're not having to build from a Docker build from scratch to give yourself a custom container for a lot of things that we're trying to do at just the code repository level, we don't need that. You can get away with picking an image from the repository, right? A lot of these are put out by Microsoft or they're put out by a lot of the other Linux vendors and it's got the bits that you need to just immediately jump in and get started with stuff. Then you have all of the additional options for anything that you need, right? If you want specific extensions or settings or if you want settings for the extensions themselves, if you want it to auto launch certain stuff after the container's up and running, you can do all of that stuff inside of the dev container itself. So for this one, we're gonna go stupid simple. Um, the only thing that is required for this, I have Docker up and running on my laptop. I have the dev containers extension. Let me show that up here so everybody can see, right? Dev containers extension from Microsoft. And then all I'm doing with this is going into the command palette and doing a dev containers, right? So for this, let me uh, let me get into a directory. We'll do this cleanly. Oh, please. Oops. All right. Okay, so once I'm in this folder so that I can define exactly that this is where this thing is gonna go and it's already flipped back to my normal profile. Flip back over to demos real quick. Okay, so I'm in this live demo directory, nothing exists here. 
But if I want to spin up a dev container, then all I'm gonna do is just go start typing in dev containers. I'm gonna say I'm gonna add a dev container configuration file. Let me zoom in one more, make sure everybody can see this. And from here, all the magic is, I can click stuff in a menu, right? Do you wanna put the configuration in your user data folder, right, for your workspace, or do you want to add this config to the workspace to share with others via source control, right? So I don't want it in my user data folder because I want to like keep it to myself. I wanna share this with somebody else. So put it in the workspace, and then you're gonna go pick the things that you want. If I wanna look at maybe Ubuntu, here's a dev container. If I wanna go look at a Debian, there's a dev container. If I wanna even just pick one that's PowerShell, it's already got a dev container for PowerShell that it picks and pulls down out of the Microsoft container registry. The one thing I will say is do not use the default Linux universal dev container. And I only found this out because, you know what, I lied, Docker's not running on my box. Let's get this going. I hate that I have to rely on power toys more than the Windows search, but at least it works. Okay. Uh, when I started prepping these demos, uh, like earlier last week, and like cleaned everything off my box just to make sure that I got uh, a view of like what these were and how long it takes to build, I didn't realize that the default um, Linux universal container was like a 13 gig image or something. Like this thing's stupidly large. It's the size of Windows containers, as god awful as those things were. So yeah, don't use that one. That's the point. I'll pull it up once it's actually built. But let's say I want to just do, we'll even do an Ubuntu and then we'll add stuff on top of it, right? So I'm gonna do 2204 for Jamie. You can pick which additional features you want to install and you can just search. If I want PowerShell, this will install PowerShell. If I want to also shove like Ansible inside of here, I can do this via Pipix. If I want to install Python, you can put this in here. Once I've picked those three, right, it shows you how many you have selected here, I'm gonna do okay. And then do you want to configure options or do you want defaults, right? I'll do configure options just so we can see what this is. Which version of PowerShell do you want, right? I'll do a 7.1. For Python, do I want to install tools? Do I want to put in like Jupyter Lab, right? Do I want to optimize everything for Python, which is god awful slow? Um, and then like which version of Python do I actually want on this thing? We'll do 3.11. Once this is done with everything that's in the menu, it'll give you that dev container.json file and you can scroll through here. Like if I wanted to change the version on PowerShell, I can do that right here. Just change it from 7.1 to latest. If I want to upgrade or roll back on Python, at least before I have provisioned the thing, then just change the version that's right here, right? This thing now lives in this folder and can be checked into my Git repository. So once I've tested this thing and I know that it works and I wanna say this is the easiest way that somebody can consume my code that has all the things that I want. And even if you wanna be the person that goes and puts a config for the extensions itself, like if you just wanna have rulers that show on the screen to try and get people to stay within a certain number of lines of characters, a uh, certain number of characters per line, you can put a bunch of that stuff inside of here, right? And then it's shared with everybody. The cool thing about all of this too, is that now that I have this thing, let's do dev containers. Boop, boop, boop. Let's do rebuild and open the container. Come on. So now I can see where it's actually going and building the dev container, right? You can get all the command line stuff that it's actually going and telling Docker to do to go build the box. If anybody really wants to, you can actually go read through all this stuff and like see what all it's doing. And, uh-oh, WSL's not happy. This will be fun. Here we go. So this will reload, and if you look down here in the bottom left corner, you can see that it's opening remote. Once this thing actually gets started up, I'm running VS Code, but it's basically closed down and relaunched, and it's running a remoting connection to that dev container that's running inside of Docker, right? So it's not, it's running on my Windows box, it's not running in the context of my Windows box. It's actually off to the side that's running in that dev container. Similar thing that happens when you get into code spaces, right? Um, if you're not using the remoting plugins inside of VS Code, go check them out. I use this all the time. I've got I actually have a remote dedicated Docker box for 
playing around with code stuff. I have a separate one that actually runs all my like radar, sonar, Plex, home automation things and whatever, but that's a different side story, right? We'll do, we'll do Plex ops later on. Um, but most of the time, I don't even have to have Docker running on my desktop, right? Because I have a spare Linux box. I've got like a little nook that just sits over there by itself and does nothing other than churn containers all day long. So I can do all of my code on that thing and not ever have to do anything other than relaunch another VS Code window to know that I'm running in the context of whatever code repository is on that. So this thing is, of course, naturally running slow. I already had this thing built. I don't know why it's rebuilding, but you know what? Here, let's do this. Why not? Probably. Let's do. Where are we trying to go here? Uh, dev containers base. All right. I'll go into this Ubuntu. Yeah, I've already got one. Ubuntu PowerShell Python. So why not? Launch another code window. Okay. So if I load this one in this directory, we have a slightly different config, right? Even just based on the fact that this one is running latest version of PowerShell and version 3.1.2 of Python. Now if I want to, I can tell it, this one should go quick since I've already got the container on disk. Dev containers. Rebuild and reopen in container. Since this image exists on disk, this one really should basically just reload. Come on quickly. Opening remote. Come on. There we go. So the nice thing about this as well is you can actually see like what's the version of the APIs that are happening on all this stuff. What's your version of Docker, either desktop or, or remote client that you have on here. What's every version of like every package that's built into this thing as it's spinning up. So you can even double check that your config files match what's actually coming out in your container environments. At this point I'm just rambling to try and you know, fill for time, so. Trust me, this is better than interpretive dance, so like we're not we're not going there quite yet. It's gonna be special. When it finally happens. Hey. It's funny, I actually have like I've I've fed people that I've worked with for years and years or that have been active in community stuff with for years and years that like every time I even like take my hat off to scratch my head or something, like they'll grab a screenshot just to like Keep it. All right. Switch from profile to reload. Let's see if we can get it. Come on, opening remote. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Man, oh man. I even rebuilt these things last night just to have them. Because I was also not going to trust downloading this thing on conference Wi-Fi either. And apparently I failed. So, okay, well, while this thing is building, Let's go ahead and go open up GitHub. We will jump over to get a code space up and going. Uh, quick coverage on code space and really, uh, like I'll even just read from the notes here, right? Similar thing, it's gonna be a dev container folder. It's gonna be a dev container.json file. You can again pull from the image registry or from a Docker file. Um, a lot of times I will do, if, if something is specifically requiring a Docker file, I'll put it in a code space rather than in a dev container just because I've already got other stuff running in Docker and occasionally I'll put stuff in the wrong directory and have weird conflicts and things like that. Uh, but there was actually a pretty good article that I stumbled across uh, earlier this week for like 10 things you can do in a code space. Um, interesting thing was doing all the bits that you need to actually load up like mid journey and do like uh, AI image generation. You can actually manage code spaces from the command line. So using the, the standard um, GitHub CLI, you can launch a code space or inject a code space into a repository that you have that already exists, which is cool. I didn't realize you could just do it from CLI. Pair programming with the teammate is phenomenal. Like I will, I will actually get into this thing and, and show uh, 
doing a live share from a dev container because you are from a code space you can spin up a code space install the live share extension and then basically just get a link to send to somebody else that they can go log in into your code space and your pair programming via github live which is cool um the one for teaching people to code was surprising to me uh harvard cs50 class is actually flipped over to doing code spaces to teach partially because of the fact that the Professors, when they have like open office hours, can actually pair program with people or like review their code live. And like even just the students can watch as the professors like clicking their cursor around on the screen. Kind of cool. Um, one awesome thing, just because it's GitHub, uh, similar to what you can do for workflows, you can actually stash environment variables for code spaces, but they're not specific to a code space. They're set in your account and they are shared environment variables for every code space that you spin up, which is kind of cool. Um, honestly, similar stuff that we've talked about with a bunch of training, right? Uh, onboarding other scripters and developers faster. Uh, coding in the cloud with your preferred editor was kind of cool. Uh, not that most of us have this deal because I think most of us have finally gotten off the ISE and just flipped over to Visual Studio Code. But code spaces will actually work natively with like Jupyter Notebooks, uh, IntelliJ, RubyMine, Goland, PyCharm, which was a surprising one to me, and like PHP Storm, which the fact that people are still coding in PHP and using PHP Storm um, was interesting. And then there's actually a lot of companies, including GitHub, that are using code spaces to do like live coding interviews with people, where that one's a little bit creepy, but they'll, they'll do like live shares on the code to actually watch what somebody's doing, I guess partially to make sure they're not cheating, but also to understand like what's their thought process and like how do they code interactively and live. So that was interesting. So first I will go get into GitHub because we have a repository, not trying to make this a sales pitch, but I actually have uh, a guy who was my old SE when I was a customer, built this tool where we have a Docker container that will spin up all of our um, Swagger open API docs and give you a running uh, Swagger API viewer, so like we can go code and test a bunch of stuff against it. It is phenomenally awesome. Um, I love how much I've learned from this thing that this dude put together. I learned a bunch about Docker and I learned a bunch more around uh, Swagger. And if I can find this thing. The cool thing about this is I spent like, I don't know, 45 seconds on this demo because I was like, hey, we've already got a Docker file in here and this thing will spin up. What happens if I just create a code space on this thing? So all I did was go create a code space and the way that he's gotten this thing written up, it starts the dev container, it'll start up the web server and I basically just like click the link and from my machine on Windows through the remoting to the GitHub code space, I get to launch a web browser and have like all of our API docs there. I was like, that's cool. Get an awesome demo that I had to do zero work for. Because I don't know about y'all, but I'm lazy slash efficient. Right? Do, 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 do. Hold up. The one thing I do need to do is the Docker run, because I, I actually intended to put this in as a post command, but then, you know, I forgot. So, but still, the fact that all I need to do is copy and paste a thing that we have documented already. Let it actually go build the container, which is way faster on GitHub servers than me trying to do it on you know, conference Wi-Fi. So that's also awesome. It'll go download. Yeah, I don't know if y'all can see this. It's telling me open my browser to localhost, right? So yes, I'm gonna go click on the localhost link, come on. Really? I'm clicking the thing. Here we go, sorry, follow link. Why are you not, I don't wanna copy it. There we go, yay, technology. This will auto forward the port for me to be able to go to what is effectively the local uh, web server, right, on local host on this box. And then just because of the project and this dude was awesome, I can decide like, oh, hey, I wanna go look at the newest version of the API docs for our flash array. And like, it's here. 
trying to get this thing running inside of my Docker environment was not terribly difficult, but you know, I had to wait for it to rebuild and go do a bunch of this stuff and whatever. I've used this before to get in and do stuff on my laptop. I'm like, uh, that's cool. And then I was like, oh, hey, I walked away and somebody called me like after I left my desk and was like headed out to dinner with somebody. And I was like, well, hold on, I got my iPad real quick. And it took me like two minutes to spin this up and be able to look at this and like go dig through our API docs in an interactive way from GitHub on my iPad. I was like, that's cool. Some of the technology is kind of awesome just for the fact that like it makes it stupidly simple to do these things. Some of it also sucks because eventually some people are gonna realize that we're never far enough away from a device that we can you know, not do it. So I'm always like, oh, I've only got my phone. I can't, yeah, sorry, fat fingers. Um, real quick, we will jump into this one because the, number one, because I actually have Kevin here who I, I heard, I had to miss it unfortunately, did an awesome session around uh, paired programming, which was cool. So what I'm gonna do here is, this is just a fork of a repository that I have for a bunch of Packer templates to build out, uh, uh, sorry, a bunch of uh, Packer profiles to build out a bunch of VMware templates, right? So open code repository where all I have is a fork of the thing locally. But since it's in my GitHub repositories for a fork, I can go mess with whatever I want on this thing. So inside of this dev container, what I'm gonna do next is go install the extension for live share. Do, 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 do. Okay, this should be faster than conference Wi-Fi. Come on. Rump, rump. It's always a good sign when the marketplace gives up on you. Well, it wasn't a challenge, please. Because that would be my luck. It's not even that like the demo would fail entirely, it's that like I would fall through the floor because that's, that's what happens to me. All right, so doing nothing other than taking this forked repository installing live share in the code space that's running up in GitHub. Once this thing is installed, it's like a one button push to just say like, do you wanna give somebody read only access? Do you wanna give read write access? Do you wanna assign it to an individual person or just let like anybody come into the thing? And then we'll go ahead and get uh, private Firefox up and running. Okay, so live share. Let it activate the extension, starting a collab session. So it already has this uh, running on the port. I'll let it, so I want to, okay. So it's automatically copied the invite link to the clipboard. So before I hit go, we will just paste this up here, right? So prod.liveshare.blah. And I'm going to say that I don't need to install this thing. Okay, make public. So when I go hit it on this other private session, it's basically gonna ask like, do you wanna actually come in with a username or do you want to just open it as like guest? Come on, conference Wi-Fi. This doesn't work, trust me, it's super cool. But legitimately, like it, it, it takes no time at all to like just click around and, and figure this out. Oh, come on. Uh, probably. Mm, no, nah. they're all exited. Oh, come on. All right, you know what, hold up, let's do it again. Shared collaboration session, copy the link. Okay. Come on, Firefox. I was thinking of sharing this with somebody in the audience, but then I was like, who do I trust to not put funky stuff on the recording? It's, you know, other than my own bad code, right? Because that's, that's just gonna happen. Okay. Come on, let it load. Do, do, do. 
All right, so we're in the live share workspace. Back over here, we should have a prompt. Come on. Reload, reload, reload. Oh man, come on. All right, you know what? We're gonna stop and we're going to do it again. Stop the session, live share. Restarting the collab session. Let's make it, okay, so invite, share it to anybody you trust. Oh yeah. Womp womp. So we'll see if this comes up. Um, otherwise, I will at least flip back for a quick overview. Uh, polyglot notebooks. I'm not going to do a decent uh, service to in six minutes, other than saying these things legitimately saved my ass at PS Confi U last year. Uh, I'd already seen Michael's session, which was phenomenal. The way that he put together. A polyglot notebook for like onboarding a person that legitimately has nothing other than like credentials and access was awesome. Um, I loved that thought process that was behind it. Uh, seeing all the extra nerd knobs for like embedding like Power BI too, I was like, well, now you're just showing off. But it was cool. Let, seriously, go go watch his uh, his session from last year and and the way that he pulled off having similar failures during his presentation as well, where some stuff like paused and took a little bit longer. He's much better at being patient than I am. Um, but basically all this is, is .NET interactive, right? If you have VS Code, if you have the .NET, at this point it's the SDK 8 um, installed on the box and then have the Polyglot Notebooks extension, that's all you need. These things are multi-language. It's essentially Markdown with code blocks inside of it. Uh, it saves previous runs, which is how it saved my ass. Uh, and it's just freaking awesome to have as a CYA because I, I saw a second presentation and. After seeing you do that in, was it April of last year? I thought it was cool. Saw somebody do another presentation uh, at PS Conf U and I was like, all right, I really should go play with these things. I went back to my hotel room that night uh, before I had my first session of that conference. And while I was half to two thirds drunk, rewrote all my uh, demos into a polyglot notebook and like ran it and was like, this is cool, it works. The next morning, before I had my DevOps 101 session, I got shoved in this room with like, I don't know, 35 seats or something. I had some coworkers standing outside because they had to pull up the blinds for people to stand outside the doors and like stare in from the outside. And they were like, hey, we gotta get you mic'd up. Like you go on in like five minutes. And I'm like, hold on, I'm talking to my wife through like powering back up the data center in my basement because I lost power and everything's down. I was sitting there and like, I even had Jeff Hicks sitting in the front row and this was like the third time he's watched me present that session last year. I got lucky that the table had a nice black tablecloth in front of it so nobody could see my legs bouncing at like a thousand miles an hour as I was freaking out. But because I had run that code one time before, I had the previous runs and was able to even like dig into the, the internal logs to show exactly how long it took for commands to run and some of the stuff that happened on the verbose stuff without having an environment based on code that I had run like 12 hours previously. It was awesome. Uh, I will do nothing other than just Go jump into that real quick. Real quick yep. Cover yo. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I legitimately, I, I warned some of y'all before we started the recording, I will be the least professional present, uh, presenter you see at this thing. It, it, potentially including Judd. Uh, that's coin toss, right? Uh, let's see. PS Confi U. Oh, you know what, hold up, hold on. Yeah, no, this thing's just dead, maybe. Yeah, live share is just not, not doing its thing. Sorry, y'all, saw a squirrel. Yeah. Did it ask? Nope. Womp womp. Yeah, let's see if we can just open this thing in the browser. Okay, while that's going, I'm gonna go get in my code repository and I'm, I can at least show the, uh, the runs that I had from this last time. And we got three minutes left, so if anybody has any questions, comments, wants to throw things at the front, feel free, now's your chance. 
I only ask that you stand up and move to the sides of the aisle because I don't want people in front of you to get hit because your aim is off. Nothing? Nobody? Okay. Dude, I'm just glad that, number one, I didn't end at like 60 minutes or at like, what was it, 45 that Grody thought he was done halfway through. Um, which, phenomenal on that dude that he thought he was done with a 45 minute session and it still ended up going over by like five minutes. Like, the random stuff that he thinks about as he's presenting that are like the offshoots of a 30 second mention of what he has inside of VS Code as like 30 other people are like, I'm gonna write that down real quick because I've never seen this thing. Uh, it's pretty awesome. But yeah, thank you all for the audience participation. Nobody died. Um, yeah, this is this is the actual point in time version of this this Power CLI uh, notebook that I had that I ran again while I was half to two thirds drunk um, from a couple months ago for a lab environment that I have destroyed and rebuilt like four times since. Um, but having this thing was awesome, and the fact that it took me. 10-ish minutes for each one of my code demos to like rewrite this thing into just the markdown and the code blocks was pretty awesome because it's not a whole lot of work to go through and like redo stuff. Um, but yeah, then like I said, actually having something to present at that conference was awesome. So if nothing else, Michael, thank you for presenting and, and actually putting it in a fashion that it made it functional for my brain to be like, ooh, I should totally do that thing. So yeah, like you can actually have text blocks. You can walk people through a process. Then you can have code and then get actual results inside of this. This is phenomenal for having a thing where you can walk somebody through your process and how you want things done. And instead of having help desk docs that have screenshots in them that are like 19 years old, you can have live, live code for this stuff and like keep the previous runs of things. Um, it's phenomenal. These also run either in dev containers or in code spaces. And then if anybody wants, I, I put a handful of links uh, in the slides. There are, we're still gonna like upload all the, all the slides to the GitHub repo for the conference, but if anybody wants to actually grab the image thing. That workshop library uh, from Microsoft is actually pretty cool. They have walkthroughs for dev containers. They have walkthroughs for code spaces. They had one that was in there for like playing around with, with REST APIs inside of a dev container. And then another one for, a, I think it was like a Python and a Flask project that I ran across last night and was like, ooh, oh, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bookmark that and not do that at three in the morning instead of prepping for the session. Um, but they have some really cool stuff that's up there. Uh, and none of this stuff is really hard to get into for a lot of these things. They have interactive demos or step-by-step. -step. Here's exactly the thing you click in the drop-down menu to make it happen. So. That's it. Uh, again, thank you all for the audience participation. I do ask, make a connection here, do stuff, share it with other people. You can find me online. Everybody please scan on the way out. I know that my numbers are not even a third of what my best buddy Anthony Nocentino is doing in the room next door, but we do have copies of the second edition of Learn PowerShell Scripting in a Month of Lunches, physical book in the back. So get a scan, it's signed by uh, James, Feel free to go get it signed by Jeff and have him like sign it bigger and in Sharpie right on top of it. Um, or if anybody wants, come find me. We will scan you and I can send you the uh, the ebook copy of it as well. So, thanks, y'all.